Okay. Well, uh, hello everyone. Uh, not sure if everybody signed in uh, at this point, but uh, uh, welcome to all of you who are here this morning uh, or this evening, if you're in Greece or, or elsewhere. Uh, this uh, is great to see this going international. I uh, really appreciate that. Uh, I want to start by thanking uh, uh, Deb Perryman and, and all the other folks uh, involved in organizing this uh, this event, uh, it, it really has been uh, a great evolution, uh, starting a few years ago to uh, today, where we have uh, quite a lineup uh, for you all. Anyway, my name is Tim Musso, and uh, I'm at the University of South Carolina, and I'm uh, an evolutionary ecologist uh, interested in how organisms uh, adapt and evolve in changing environments. And a number of years ago, I, I somehow managed to <laughs> get involved in in research involving the effects of of radioactivity, mostly from nuclear accidents, uh, like the ones that occurred uh, in, at Chernobyl in 1986, and more recently in Japan at Fukushima in 2011. And uh, so today, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, share a few, few of the results of some of the studies that we've been doing over the last uh, few years related to the effects of, of radiation in the environment, uh, in particular, the effects of radiation on, on wildlife. And uh, it really is uh, uh, interesting to be here. Anyway, the um, you know the, the question I get all the time is, you know, you're you're an evolutionary ecologist. Why are you interested in in studying the effects of radioactivity uh, at uh, these these disaster sites? And and you know, I, I never really ever thought I'd be doing this uh, if you'd asked me 20 years ago. But um, but somehow uh, we realized that there was a lot of uh, of interest in, uh, in, in, in the effects of, of radiation. Uh, and, uh, and, and so uh, when the opportunity arose to get started, we decided that it was worth doing because really there was been, there's been relatively little uh, in terms of research on wildlife in these different kinds of places. Most of the past research that's been done uh, on radiation effects have been done in the laboratory on lab animals or uh, studies of atomic bomb survivors. Uh, and and th these, of course, are very important, but, but they really don't tell us uh, as much as we would like about how natural systems react to these kinds of, of, of environmental changes. Uh, and because of the, the size of the disasters at, at Chernobyl and Fukushima in terms of the amount of radioactivity released and, and, and how wide and far it was dispersed, this gives us an opportunity to to do landscape scale ecological and evolutionary studies over, over many years. Uh, and, and hopefully this will provide the information we need to, to study populations and, and, and ecosystem responses in the future, should there be any kind of uh, future accident. So that, you know, the, the, the basic question is, uh, you know, why study radiation effects in natural systems? Well, first, you know, again, you have to remember that radiation can't be seen, tasted, smelled, or felt but it's everywhere in our environment. Uh, it, it's, it's ubiquitous. Um, also, it's been well documented for, for uh, more than 100 years, since the time of Marie Curie, that ionizing radiation can have very large negative effects on biological systems. Uh, anthropogenic sources of radiation, that, i.e. those that are generated through human activities, uh, the, um, were uh, really um, are increasing dramatically. And, uh, and so we're we're having to, we're being faced with with increases in radiation. We need to know what these consequences are. Uh, there's likely to be future accidents at nuclear power plants. Uh, that seems very very much the case. Then we even have you know terrorism, dirty bombs, and the kind of that kind of thing that may again introduce extra extra radioactivity. Uh, and then there's even the threat of nuclear war. Uh, and so. Uh, we really need to know uh, more about what these effects might be. Um, the, I just got a question from Deb about what caused the radioactive blasts. And, you know, the, uh, the, both of these uh, accidents really were triggered, were the result of human error, either in design or in operations. In Chernobyl, it was, it was an operational error on the part of the, uh, the folks running the reactor. They made a mistake, they miscalculated, and this led to a meltdown. Explosions and a radioactive fire that again spewed radionuclides across the landscape. In Fukushima, it was triggered. The original trigger for the accident was the uh, 
the, the, the enormous earthquake, the, the, the earthquake that was 9.0 on the Richter scale, that triggered a very large tsunami, an unprecedented, well, almost unprecedented tsunami, giant wave that uh, really flooded the backup generating systems for the reactor. Uh, again, this was a design error, and hence a human error uh, in, in, in the design of this, this facility. Uh, and this led to the meltdown at uh, three of the reactors there. So, so again, uh, most of the time, this is the, uh, the product of human error, it seems, but, uh, but you know, usually in combination with, with other factors that, that are beyond our control. So, um, you know, so why do we want to study radiation uh, in, in the environment? Uh, you know, the first point is that there are many nuclear reactors around the world, and these are not going to disappear. They're going to be with us for, for many, many years to come. There's actually quite a few that are under construction. And so we need to, uh, and, and there's likely to be accidents in the future. So we need to know more about the, the impacts of accidents at nuclear power plants. But even the ones that aren't undergoing accidents are actually releasing large quantities of radioactivity during normal operations. Uh, the nuclear industry has done uh, gr made great strides to reduce these effluents, these radioactive effluents, but they're still there. And, and, and the impacts of these effluents are largely unknown. Uh, many people think they're, they're, they're likely to be very true, very small compared to other environmental factors. And that may be true, uh, but unfortunately the, the, the studies, the rigorous studies to test these for these kinds of effects are really not in there at this moment, at least for environmental effects on, on wildlife. Um, you know, atomic bombs, nuclear explosions, uh, there have been uh, many, many nuclear explosions uh, over the last uh, 60 years. Uh, you know, in fact, uh, we used to test atomic bombs uh, quite regularly. Uh, a number were exploded in the atmosphere in, in various parts of the world, including, for instance, the Marshall Islands in, in the South Pacific, where the U.S. conducted many of its tests. And these, these, these bombs uh, released enormous quantities of radioactivity into the environment. Uh, uh, you know, for most of us not living near these test sites, the, 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 uh, you know, the, the deposition of radionuclides was uh, relatively small, perhaps, although still measurable. But in the areas where the testing was done, these areas are often still very highly contaminated. And yet, there's been relatively little uh, done to, uh, to determine their impacts. Um, and again, of course, you know, the big concern right recently has been that um, <laughs> some of the, the political instability that exists uh, in the world uh, right now could, could conceivably lead to a, a nuclear war. We certainly hope not, but uh, that's certainly a possibility. Uh, and so we need to know how to respond to that. But perhaps the most important source of, of radioactivity in the environment for most of us who you know, don't live near to a, uh, to a, 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 an atomic bomb test site or a nuclear accident uh, is the radiation that's, that's being used in, in medical uh, services uh, for, medical, for treatment of various kinds of cancers, for instance, uh, for imaging of, of various things. Uh, and so um, the, uh, you know, again, most of the, and, and I'm not trying to say that, there, that these, uh, the, use, the medical use of radiation isn't advantageous, it's hugely advantageous uh, for many people. But there are also hazards associated with this, and we really need to know more to determine what those risks are. How long does it take to, for the radioactivity from these accidents uh, to, to clear up? Well, you know, we are very optimistic that, in, for instance, in Fukushima in Japan, you know, the area of radioactivity, at least on land, uh, it, it was relatively small relative to, uh, to Chernobyl. And, and, and we're actually thinking that this might be um, uh, you know, this might actually re disappear. The effects might be minimized over over the coming decades. Chernobyl, many of the areas are extremely highly contaminated, and so uh, and 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 the contamination levels are much higher and spread over uh, a much wider area. And the sort of the radionuclides, the sources of radiation, are are much more long lived in some cases, and so the effects are going to be there for for quite a while. In terms of biodiversity effects, we're going to get there. We're going to talk quite a bit about uh, the impacts on, on birds and insects and other things, but that'll come a little bit later in the talk. Uh, here's the area in Japan uh, that was affected mostly by the, um, uh, the, the impacts here. Uh, you can see the, the red areas and the blue areas are, are areas that are still 
quite radioactive. Um, let's see, accidents, we're going to have more accidents in the future. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there's no doubt about that. It's just, you know, that, you know there, despite all the safety measures and, and for instance, in commercial aviation, occasionally a plane still crashes. Uh, the same could be said of almost any technology. It's going to fail uh, at some point, and we need to be prepared for that. Um, let's see, economic costs. Um, let's see, Nathan asked whether there was a, an effect of, uh, with the body of water next to Japan. And, and again, there's been relatively little studies in, in, in terms of the, um, uh, the impacts on the marine system other than to measure the levels of radioactivity in the fish. And almost no studies have been done to look at the biological consequences of that contamination. And so, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it's, uh, uh, it's, a, it's an area that needs further study. Uh, let's see, uh, Donna here asks, if I've ever been to these contaminated sites? And, and the answer is, uh, absolutely. Um, you know, I started working in Chernobyl in 2000 for real in research. Uh, and, and also in Fukushima in July 2011, doing our studies of birds and insects and microbes, whatever we could catch. Uh, and um, this slide's a little old. We're up to over 40 expeditions to Chernobyl and, uh, and 25 expeditions to Fukushima. And, and you know, I'm going to tell you what it's a little bit like uh, <laughs> in the coming slides. And uh, one point I did want to make with this slide right here is, is the point that um, I'm an evolutionary ecologist, uh, and uh, I'm interested in genetic effects. I don't actually care whether they're positive or negative or in between, and uh, and and we don't really uh, we're not activists against anti-nuclear. We're not anti-nuclear activists in, in any in any kind of way. That's not what motivates us to do this research. We're motivated by the science. We're we're motivated by the by the the discovery and exploration part of, of doing science, and uh, and so anything we find is, is of great interest to us. So let's see here. Um, you know, since this is science, you know, we, we like to frame what we do uh, in terms of hypotheses and, and testable questions. And, you know, the first big question that always comes up when you talk about radiation is, does this lead to increased mutation rates in these natural populations? We know in the lab, if you, if you zap critters with, with radiation, it, it does lead to enhanced mutation rates, but usually we're using much higher levels of radiation. So the question is, do the sorts of low doses that we see in Fukushima and Chernobyl and atomic bomb test sites, do these results in increased mutation rates in natural populations? Uh, the second question really is, uh, even with these increased mutation rates, do we see any effects on the organisms in terms of their, their shape and size and ability to reproduce? Uh, you know, do these effects have fitness consequences? Uh, in other words, do they affect how long organisms live or how much do they reproduce or are they more vulnerable to disease? Uh, these kinds of issues that, that could influence evolutionary outcomes uh, and, and, and ability to, to adapt to this changing environment. And finally, uh, and the big point here is, you know, really for this talk is, are there effects on populations abundances and, and biodiversity, the organisms that live there? Uh, but we really need to go through this sort of series of, of, of questions to really get to these population and, and uh, ecosystem level effects. So I'm going to run you quickly through some of our key results for, you know, over the past decade or so. And, and you know, the first, the first really big question is, you know, are there mutational effects resulting from, from the radiation due to Chernobyl and Fukushima? And we've done a whole bunch of studies over the last decade. Uh, there have been a whole bunch of other studies done uh, around the world looking at this question, and yet, uh, it, it, you know, some people would suggest that the, this question is still unanswered. So to get at this, we actually did uh, what we call a meta-analysis, where we took all of the studies we could find from, from, from around the world uh, related to Chernobyl, put them into a single data set, and then did the analysis using a fairly rigorous statistical approaches that are being commonly used in, in medicine and science. And, and, and what we found was overwhelming, just absolutely overwhelming evidence that uh, the, uh, the consequences of, of the Chernobyl radiation uh, generate uh, large amounts of genetic data, much increased mutational load uh, in a wide variety of different systems. 
This graph right here, uh, if you can see, these red lines actually represent individual studies done by a variety of different people, some by us. Uh, down on the x-axis at the bottom here uh, the, uh, the is, is the effect size. This is how big an effect on genetic load there was. And so most of these studies now show very conclusively that there are genetic consequences. Uh, Nathan asks, is, is Chernobyl used as a tour site? And <laughs> yes, yeah, it's really, you know, tourism has become a big part of, of working in Chernobyl now. And, and in fact, this last summer I was working in Pripyat and there were literally thousands of visitors walking around. And, and this, this may or may, may not be a good idea, but uh, of course, where they take the tourists tend to be areas that are not, not really highly contaminated, but there's still a fair bit of contamination. And, and, and so there, there's, it's kind of surprising to see so many tourists wandering around relatively unprotected. So anyway, how do we get at these questions? And, and, and you know, the, the only way to do it is to actually go there and to do field studies of, of organisms. And, and so, uh, you know, again, we've been to Chernobyl uh, many, many times now. And, uh, you know, the really fun part of, of doing biology is getting to know, uh, uh, you know, what's going on by actually looking at the organisms. And, and, and yes, one of the, one of the uh, you know, Maria asks if there's animals living in Chernobyl right now. And the answer is, yeah, there are many animals there. Uh, and, 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 and this is because the, you know, the levels of radiation aren't so high that they kill animals instantly. The question is whether or not the sorts of mutations that accumulate as a result of, of the radioactivity uh, build up over time. Uh, enough to cause the animals to have shorter lives and fewer offspring. And that's really the, sort of the level that we're interested in for this low dose kind of uh, exposure. So we catch the animals, uh, in this case, a lot of birds. Uh, and these are, you know, this is a, this is a, a mist net here. You can see in the background a fuzzy uh, cooling tower from number six reactor that, that wasn't never completed. Uh, and the birds caught in the net sort of like catching fish, but this, in, this, in this case, it's birds. You know, we've string neck, nets all around. Uh, in fact, while we were doing this particular study, we had about a half a mile of, of these mist nets running through the forest alongside meadows so that we could catch all the birds coming to and fro. They, they were going out to catch, uh, you know, insects and, and other things to feed their babies. And uh, here we have some nets, as you can see in the background, there's a little bit of, uh, you can see sort of the cooling towers or the, the, the exhaust uh, pipes from the reactors in the background. We have a big crew uh, setting up this half mile of, of mist nets to catch the birds. Uh, and, you know, really, uh, really interesting uh, work. Here we are in the field in our little tent, uh, measuring the birds, taking blood samples, uh, and putting little rings on them, uh, seeing how much they weigh. Uh, this is a shot of, of weighing a, uh, this is a cuckoo bird. Uh, most of you probably know about cuckoo clocks. Well, this is the bird that makes that sound. Uh, it goes cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. And we've actually done studies showing that the song of the cuckoo is uh, affected by the radiation as well. Uh, Nathan asks, uh, are the plants affected by radioactivity? And I'm gonna show you a few slides of, of, of how the plants are affected uh, in, in a few minutes, but, uh, Here's a, here's a photo of, uh, you know, one of the, uh, an owl that we caught in during one of our collections. It's, again, really, really cool to be able to get to these places and to, to, to actually hold up close some of these organisms. Here's a slide of, of our favorite study bird. This is a barn swallow. You have these in your backyard probably, or at least down by the river where you live. Uh, they like to nest under bridges, also in barns. And this particular uh, swallow here is part of our ongoing experiments. Uh, we have a little ring tag on its leg, and this little ring actually uh, uh, has a number so we can identify the individual, but it's also got a miniature radiation detector, a miniature dosimeter. And, and when we recatch this bird the following year, we can actually get a pretty good idea of how big a dose it's had during uh, that the year before. And we can relate that to the effects that we see. So what, so we, I just showed you about the, uh, the, the meta-analysis of genetic effects. What are, you know, we've done a bunch of other kinds of characters. Um, unfortunately, the, the tags that we have, uh, Nathan asked, can we use this tag to locate animals? Uh, and, and with the barn swallows, we don't need anything to locate them because the barn swallows actually come back to the same 
place that's often the same nest to breed year after year. And so we actually just have to make sure we go back to the same area to, to recapture them. If he's not, if that bird isn't, isn't there the next year, that means it's died. And so we can actually uh, get a pretty good idea of how long they live. Um, do the animals stay away from the reactors? Um, the, uh, you know, they, because radiation can't be seen, smelled, tasted, the, uh, uh, you know, you can't really, um, you really can't, the animals can't, you know, detect it other than by looking at the surrounding area, maybe seeing that there aren't as many insects, maybe the plants aren't as, uh, don't have as many flowers available. So there are indirect ways to detect it, but there's no direct way uh, to do it. Uh, do we do, let's see, what time of the year are our studies done? Well, most of our studies on birds are done in the spring, in June in, in Ukraine, uh, and, and also in Fukushima, because that's when the birds are breeding. So anyway, the first kind of trait we looked at in these birds was to look at their fertility, in particular male fertility. Uh, are the sperm affected? And this is a hot topic these days because, uh, you know, for instance, the study recently reported showing that in Western countries, in humans, male fertility has been dropping off dramatically over the last few years. Uh, the BBC even suggested <laughs> that, that humans might go extinct if this kind of drop in fertility continues. Uh, that's a fairly provocative statement, but, but, it, but it speaks to the fact that the reproductive ability is affected by, by the environment in various ways. And so we've studied this in, in a bunch of bird species, uh, published uh, a number of papers. And one of the reasons I did want to mention that one of the reasons I show the title page of, of these scientific studies uh, that we've published is to make the point that, that it's really important when, when you know, reading about this kind of research that you verify that the report, the, the data, were actually published in a peer-reviewed scientific journal. That gives it some level of credibility. So anyway, we, 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 we looked at all these birds for several years, uh, thousands of birds, in fact, and found that, much to our surprise and the surprise of many other people, in some years, uh, in the more contaminated areas, up to 40% of the birds actually were completely sterile. Uh, the males had no sperm at all. And this was a really unexpected finding. Uh, but yeah, we were talking about plants. Uh, you know, we're not animal chauvinists, and so <laughs> you know, we work with, with plants if we can as well. And uh, the, uh, we've done a number of studies at looking at the equivalent uh, the male gametes in plants for, you know, the pollen. And, and again, the basic finding is that the pollen viability, uh, the ability of pollen to, to germinate and do its work, uh, uh, is uh, greatly affected by, by radioactivity. It's much lower in the areas of high radioactivity. Uh, and, and more interestingly, some really interesting new findings here have shown that the, the, the effects are much greater in, uh, in Fukushima uh, than they are currently in Chernobyl. And this probably reflects the fact that uh, the radiation, the highest levels of radiation are relatively recent. The plants there had never experienced this kind of, of perturbation before. And so uh, we see uh, a lot of very sensitive individuals disappearing or being affected by the radiation. Let's see, Maria Kay asks about in Kerala, India, we know for more than 20 years that the area some areas have more than 20, 60 milligrays due to thorium. People still live there. It'd be interesting to see how the evolution has affected them. Absolutely, very good point. And uh, yeah, we're trying to do work in other parts of the world, in Brazil. Uh, I'm, I've been trying to get to southern India for a while, uh, and uh, in the areas of France that, that are highly contaminated through natural sources, uh, and to, to actually get at that question. There have been quite a number of studies in these naturally radioactive areas. We actually wrote a, a review paper, uh, I don't have a graph from it here, but uh, showing that even in naturally radioactive areas, we see effects of the radiation. They're not nearly as big as they are for Chernobyl or Fukushima, and this suggests that perhaps there's been adaptation in these areas uh, to the radioactivity, and I'll, I'll, but I'll present to you a little uh, slide on that question a little bit later on if we have time. Uh, so pollen, uh, pollen is affected. We've also shown that the germination of seeds is, is way down in areas of high radioactivity. And this is, again, this could be in part because the pollen is inviable. Uh, and, uh, and so this, this is a big, uh, big ongoing question. Uh, EHS 
to T, <laughs> ask about the ask about the fish and and if they're still edible. And um, you know, it sort of depends on 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 where you get the fish from. If you catch the fish from very close to the the reactor in Fukushima, for instance, uh, they are still fairly contaminated, but further away from the reactor, the levels of, of radioactivity in the fish have gone way down. And so one, many people would consider them to be, be edible. Although there's still measurable levels in, in many of the fish that are caught, they're, they're below uh, a level that, that some people consider to be safe. Uh, I would argue that there is no safe level, but that's, that's another discussion. Uh, let's see. The next kind of trait that we've looked at, uh, again, you know, is, is this issue of cancer. You know, the first thing people think of, about usually when you talk, when you say radiation is, you know, is there cancer uh, associated with that? And, and so um, uh, we've looked at this in, in birds as best we can. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, by catching all of these birds, in this case, uh, 1,700 birds or so uh, in Fukushima a few, and Chernobyl a few years ago. And, and, and again, the, the, the results were rather stunning. Uh, basically, we find that, yes, indeed, in areas of higher contamination, uh, there's a much higher frequency of, of tumors uh, in, in these organisms. We, we haven't had the resources to determine whether or not these tumors are all malignant or not. Uh, in fact, there's not a lot known about cancers in animals, although it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an emerging topic of interest around the world. So. We hope to continue this work to look at the nature of these tumors, but it's very clear that, uh, you know, again, we're seeing evidence of increased tumor uh, frequencies in these wild populations that are never, ever seen in any other areas of the world. Many of the tumors tend to be near the eyes or the heads of these birds, uh, and but not always. Here's a tumor on the wing of, 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 of a bird in this Chernobyl area, and so, um, Again, very high frequencies of, of tumors, uh, unexpectedly so, but again, mostly in these areas of high contamination, of relatively high radiation. Another trait that, that's been of interest to uh, radiation specialists for many years is the fact that the eyes tend to be very, very sensitive to, to radiation, the lens of the eye in particular. Uh, this was discovered, again, uh, uh, you know, 80, or 80 years ago or so, uh, following cancer treatment of women who were pregnant during their treatment for, for various cancers with, with radiation, either x-rays or gamma rays or, or radium. And, uh, and so we decided to uh, look at this question. And you know, again, in humans, it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty strong effects if, if, the, if the fetus, the developing fetus in particular, is exposed to radiation. Uh, many of the atomic bomb survivors uh, showed early onset radiation-induced kinds of cancers. And so we wanted to look at this in birds as well. Uh, and so, yeah, we went out to, again, looking at our birds, published a, a, a couple of papers on this topic, showing, again, that the incidence of, of cataract, this cloudiness in the eye, uh, was much higher in these areas of high radiation. Uh, here's Tim here with his little scope uh, taking pictures of the eye. In this case, it's, this is a hoopoo, which is a really cool bird with a big, long beak, makes an interesting kind of uh, sound as well. Uh, again, really fun to, to catch and handle these birds. We don't hurt them at all. Uh, we release them back to the, the environment and most of them come back. <laughs> but here are some pictures of, <coughs> excuse me, here are some pictures of the sorts of effects on eyes. Again, lots of cloudiness uh, and other kinds of deformities. Uh, we've also repeated this with um, the uh, different species, uh, including uh, small rodents, mostly in Chernobyl, where we again find the same effect of radiation leading to increased rates of, of, of cataract. Uh, last year, or the year before, we brought an expert from Columbia University uh, to, to, to repeat our studies. And again, the basic finding is that, yes, these animals exposed to radioactivity from Chernobyl show increased rates of, of cataract. Nathan asks, did the survivors of the atomic bombs going to have children or were they kept in captivity? Uh, for the people, no, they weren't kept in captivity. Uh, and uh, they, they, you know, again, they've, yes, they've gone on to have children. And this is a st study, subject of, of great interest to see what happens in the offspring of, of the children who were exposed. Uh, Deb asks, what's the radius of safety from the area a human can live without protective gear? And, you know, many people would argue that there is no safe exposure, extra exposure, uh, 
Uh, it's just that it gets less and less and less the further away you go. Although, you know, in, in Chernobyl, uh, you know, again, because of the, the, the patterns of wind and rainfall, there are areas of high radioactivity in Finland and Norway, uh, Austria and other areas. Uh, and so there's, all their, there's other kinds of issues. Let's see, next question. Are you finding any signs of miscarriages or, or uh, fatal deformities in young offspring? Unfortunately, uh, there's not a lot of data on that, but there, but there is some uh, from Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus suggesting that, that this is an issue there. Uh, again, unfortunately, the data are, are often uh, very weak in, in, in terms of the dosimetry, and so it's often hard to, to link some of these consequences, these health outcomes specifically to the, to the dose that these folks received. Another, another topic, again, inspired by another end point inspired by atomic bomb survivors uh, was the finding that, that, you know, again, children who were exposed to the radiation while in utero inside their mother as fetuses uh, tended to have uh, uh, neurological problems, mental retardation, smaller brains, uh, and, 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 and so we actually, so we decided that we needed to look at this in the birds and the some rodents. And again, we're finding that same kind of effect with smaller brains. Uh, and, and, and we know that for the birds, this is important because the, the birds with smaller brains have actually a, a dramatically reduced probability of surviving to the next year. So this implies that there, is, there are cognitive consequences of this smaller brain, uh, even in birds. Uh, and so um, this, this is, uh, you know, an ongoing area of interest, especially for humans who are exposed in utero to, to, to radiation. Um, in, in Fukushima, they've, they've also detected uh, uh, head size and, uh, and brain size effects on the, uh, the macaques. Uh, I think actually in this case, it was mainly the uh, uh, looking at differences in the head size, but for most organisms, there's a, there's a reasonably good relationship between head size and brain size. Uh, it's not, again, just the animals that are affected in terms of these developmental abnormalities. In trees, we see all sorts of effects. Uh, and apologize for the Japanese slide. But, but again, when you cut down a tree in areas of high contamination, you can actually see where the, the Chernobyl event occurred. It leads to changes in growth rates of the trees, uh, even and, and differences in the quality of the wood that's generated, uh, and also the growth form. Uh, this slide shows, you know, what typical what a typical stand of of, of of Scots pines look like in the Chernobyl area and in areas that are not radioactive. Um, <laughs> if I can speak all these other languages, uh, unfortunately, uh, I, I, my French is reasonably good. Uh, I'm originally French Canadian, and <laughs> but uh, and I speak a little bit of Russian and enough to negotiate a taxi fare and a little bit of Japanese. Uh, but unfortunately, not not nearly well enough. But here is a here are some of the Scots pines after they've been affected by radiation. And again, you can see the you know the growth forms are really uh, really unusual and aberrant. And the results they're the result of effects of radiation on the growing tips of these these plants. Uh, interestingly enough, we're seeing the same kinds of effects uh, in Japan now uh, with changes in the growth forms of some of the the more vulnerable species of of trees, uh, in this case, Japanese fir trees. Uh, one of my favorite, you know, I started off really as an entomologist, and so I've been very interested in looking at the effects on, on insects. And here we have uh, one of my favorite insects from Chernobyl. It's, it's called a firebug. It's called a firebug because it's, you know, bright red. Uh, and this bright red and this kind of sort of color pattern here uh, serves to warn predators of birds mostly, that this is a poisonous insect. And, and, and sort of like monarch butterflies, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's very flashy. And you can see this kind of face mask looking image. And, and, and we, we, we think this, that this may actually serve to help cue the bird that, we think this, that this may actually serve to help cue the bird that, you know, here, I'm, I'm a poisonous bug, don't eat me. And uh, but these bugs occur everywhere, and, and, and much to our surprise, uh, we found that uh, the bugs from more radioactive areas, shown here on the right side of the slide, uh, you know, have these uh, much higher frequencies of, of ab abnormal color patterns, uh, and uh, it, it's really quite striking. 
uh, we're just uh, some of the undergraduates in my lab are just uh, completing experiments with these bugs where we're showing that the, 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 the mutations associated, the underlying genetic mutations associated with this change in color uh, is, are inherited. They're passed from one generation to the next. We can increase their expression by inbreeding these, these bugs. And uh, uh, we don't know uh, if, if, if the toxins are affected. And that, that's certainly uh, uh, an area that we hope to, to move into in the future to see if, if the mutations are also affecting the toxicity. And, and this may lead to these bugs being uh, more edible uh, and, and affecting their, their overall fitness. Um, the same sorts of developmental abnormalities and inherited mutations are also being seen in some insects in Japan. So again, we see this, this replication of, 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 of effects in both locations, in both Chernobyl and Fukushima. And this, again, provides strong scientific evidence that the underlying cause is likely to be the radioactive contaminants. And again, we've looked at a bunch of other different uh, organisms, including spiders. And I'm not going to spend too much time on that. I'm going to get now to this, you know, the main question here that, that for, the, for today, this issue of, of biodiversity and, you know, the question of how is, is animal abundance and, and diversity affected by the radiation in these areas? And to get at this, we've done, again, a whole lot of field work. I've spent many, many months uh, traveling through Fukushima and Chernobyl, uh, counting organisms and, and, and determining uh, the biodiversities in given areas. And we've looked at everything from bacteria uh, to, to, to primates, uh, and monkeys in the case of, of, of Japan. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and part of the motivation for doing this kind of work is, is to, to address some of these reports in the media that we see that, um, you know, there's the suggestion that wildlife in Chernobyl is thriving, that they're everywhere, that there are many animals. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an Eden for, for animals. And, and, you know, like so many of these kinds of uh, suggestions, there's an element of truth to this in the sense that in Chernobyl, where there's now a fence around it, where there's, you know, relatively no hunting, uh, the animals that normally would have been hunted have increased overall in number since before the accident. Before there was a power plant here, of course, there was no, there were none of these animals because they were all hunted. And so, so the animals have come back uh, in response to the lack of hunting pressure. Uh, but the question, the bigger question, the more important question is, is whether or not they're also being affected by radioactivity. And so by studying all of these animals, the, the ones that are hunted, plus the ones that aren't hunted, like the birds, most of the birds we look at and the insects, which are clearly not hunted, we can start to get at the relative importance of, you know, direct human effects versus the effects of radiation. And so, um, so we, again, we've spent lots and lots of time in Chernobyl counting and catching organisms. Uh, in, in Chernobyl, we've been looking basically at 300 different locations to see how animal abundance and diversity is affected. Uh, and comparing this to clean areas, uh, both within the Chernobyl zone and outside. Uh, and in Fukushima, Japan, again, 400 locations that we've been repeatedly doing counts of various types of organisms, including the birds and the insects. And so um, uh, we, we, we're starting to get a pretty good idea of what's going on with respect to these organisms. Uh, again, this slide here is just to show you that we've done many of these studies. We've published many papers in the, in the scientific literature. Uh, uh, related to this topic, uh, so they've gone through peer review. They have some some measure of credibility, and the basic findings are this: in Chernobyl, uh, at least ten years ago, uh, when we when we finished these first studies, um, in in terms of the birds, we found that in areas of highest contamination, uh, there are many fewer birds uh, in in these areas of high contamination. You can sort of see it at this graph down at you know 100 microsieverts per hour and higher, uh, then you're, you're unlikely to see more than a couple of birds at a given spot. Uh, and um, uh, Deb asks here, how many years of research have you alone put into this subject? Uh, well, I started uh, in 19, uh, in 2000, well, my first visit to Chernobyl was in 1999, and that was really just to sort of look around and see what was going on. But our first study of barn swallows began in 2000. Uh, my partner in most of this research is a Danish uh, ornithologist, evolutionary biologist who works in France, uh, Andres Moller. Uh, 
And uh, you know, Anders is a, a brilliant scientist who's been studying uh, birds for much longer than me. And uh, the uh, and and so this 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 uh, we've been at it for quite a while. Uh, the the next question related to this though is, does this reduced abundance lead to changes in biodiversity? And again, in Chernobyl, uh, we see many fewer species of birds uh, in these areas of high contamination. Uh, Dimitri asks, do, do migratory birds cause mutations to spread to areas unaffected by radiation, perhaps by mating with unaffected birds? And Dimitri, that is a fabulous question. That's one of, one of the key motivators for the research we're doing. We, we, we do, we're very interested in addressing this issue of, of, of you know, because the birds are not killed by the radiation, they're simply, their lives are shortened, uh, and, and, uh, but, but many of them survive to reproduce. And, and of course, they dis many organisms disperse. And so they are, in fact, indeed, spreading these mutations to adjacent populations where there's no radioactivity. Uh, and, and we have some indirect evidence of this by looking at a number of different genetic markers and, and other kinds of markers to show that that this is the case. We're also showing the reverse. We're showing that some of these populations in Chernobyl are actually being maintained, only being maintained through immigration. New birds coming in from adjacent areas that don't have the mutations. And so they're probably, they're, they're actually having a positive effect uh, in these areas of high contamination. Uh, one of the reasons it's really good to work with, say, uh, plants uh, and, and insects is that they often have very low, small home ranges. And so we can actually investigate the relative importance of this kind of dispersal, either Im emigration or immigration, on this process of mutation selection balance and, and how this affects adaptation. That's one of our main interests, really. Uh, in Chernobyl, after all of these studies, we find that all groups of, of organisms that we've looked at, you know, birds, mammals, insects, spiders, they all show depressed numbers uh, in the areas of high contamination. Now, not all species do this. There are many species in Chernobyl that actually are not affected by the radiation. Uh, there are some species that actually even go up in areas of high radiation. We think that may be because of the lack of competition <laughs> you know, or lack of predators. Uh, but uh, we still need to know a lot more about this. But we also know that there's some evidence that some groups are just really much more resistant to the effects of radiation. And, and understanding how they are resistant really is an important question. Um, and so we're trying to get at that. In Fukushima, what happens to the birds? Well, in Fukushima, again, we've done a bunch of these studies, published them, and, and the results are really, really overwhelming. Um, if you look at this graph here, if you look at these areas of high uh, contamination, you know, 30 and above microsieverts per hour when using a Geiger counter, uh, you're very unlikely to see more than a few birds in a given spot. And, and this is after removing all the other environmental factors that might play some role in determining abundance of different birds. We, we get at that by, by doing statistical analyses that include these other environmental factors. We look at species richness or biodiversity. It's the same deal. Basically, we're unlikely to see more than a few species in these areas of high contamination, whereas in the areas of you know, relatively low contamination, we might see you know, five, six, seven, ten, even ten species in a given spot uh, in a five-minute period where we, we do the counts. So big effects on the bird biodiversity. Um, I'm going to skip this because it's a little, a little technical, but you know, basically, uh, I guess I'll mention it since we got it up. The basic point here is that uh, we've collaborated with some of the uh, best-known radio ecologists in the world. Uh, to actually refine our studies by using dose reconstruction. Uh, some of you in the audience are into this kind of thing, I know. Uh, and, uh, and so in response to that concern, uh, we collaborated with a group in France to do the dose reconstruction and, and basically found the same sorts of patterns when we used actual doses to individual birds uh, uh, and then basically showed that, yeah, abundances at a given spot decrease with, it, with the increasing dose and that this is a relatively linear response with no kind of threshold below which there's no effect. So even a small amount of additional radiation leads to a small negative consequence. Uh, let's move right along. The, you know, humans, we're mammals. And, and there's you know, been suggestions that maybe mammals are better able to, do, you know, to repair the damage related to 
to uh, the DNA damage from radiation. And so we've started a bunch of studies uh, in both Chernobyl and Fukushima to look at what, how the mammals are doing, and the large mammals in particular. Turns out the only way to really get at this <laughs> rigorously is to put out a whole bunch of, of motion activated cameras to the environment. This has become very popular because these cameras have become quite inexpensive. And so we put out several hundred of these cameras in both places uh, at various times for, for several years now. And, and it's really cool. Uh, you know, you see all of these animals that, that you would never otherwise see, even you know, walking around very carefully and quietly through the forest, you still will never encounter this particular animal here. For instance, this is in Fukushima. This is a sero uh, or a goat antelope. Uh, it's, it's a national animal of Japan, and, and it's very secretive, and, and, and you almost never see it uh, when you're walking through the woods, but these cameras pick them up all the time. Uh, very, very cool. Uh, here's a wild boar, the wild pig. Again, uh, the pigs have increased dramatically in numbers in, in Fukushima. They, they had increased in Chernobyl, but they, they were uh, hit by a, by a disease, swine fever, and so many of the pigs have actually disappeared from Chernobyl in the last uh, five, six years. Uh, you know, we see foxes in, in both Chernobyl and Fukushima, uh, and, and sometimes we even see what they're eating because they're, they'll be carrying, you know, a rabbit in their mouth that they've just, they've just captured uh, back to the den. Um, occasionally we see these really exotic critters. Uh, here's a lynx in Chernobyl. Uh, very, very cool to see these, these critters that, again, you would never, ever encounter. In Fukushima, we, we saw the first black Asiatic bear uh, that they'd ever reported in this part of Fukushima uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, uh, yeah, this was quite the uh, event for the media at the time. Uh, they, uh, uh, all the television stations wanted to come see where we'd see, found this bear. Uh, and, and again, this reflects the fact that there's no hunting, there's no people. And so yeah, animals are coming back from adjacent areas where, where they had been hiding. Uh, this is something that's not gonna work. Uh, but again, uh, these, these, these images, these cameras are just so cool uh, because they allow you to get at uh, what's actually there. Here's uh, the Shabalski's horse. This, was, this is the progenitor to the modern domestic horse, the Mongolian horse. These are the horses you see on cave drawings, for instance, in, in Europe. Uh, and uh, they were introduced to Chernobyl uh, early on to see if they, well, basically because they thought it might be a good home for them given given that it's really expensive to maintain horses in, in, uh, in captivity. Uh, and, and so there's a herd of, there's several herds of a uh, total of about 70 animals at this moment. And we've been trying to track their success and survival as well. You know, here's, here's a moose. Uh, in, in Chernobyl, we see lots of these giant moose. They are so cool. Uh, and, uh, and again, you, you rarely see them in the wild. Uh, oftentimes we'll see animals with their young, and so we can actually estimate reproductive rates in some of these cases. We can follow individuals for several years to see how long they live. Um, let's see, I wanted to show you a couple of short videos while we're, we're, while we're here. Uh, again, just give you some idea of what, uh, what, we, can, what we can see. It's really very cool. Um, let's see here. Uh, yeah, so this is a uh, a, a bobcat, and let's see. Here's a here's here's a cool one. Uh, this is a a coyote here. This, these were actually set up here in Colombia. But you see this coyote that's coming through. It's got a rabbit in its mouth. <laughs> He's uh, again bringing bringing food home. Uh, let's see. Maria K asked me a question here. She says. I can humbly suggest not using Geiger counters to measure radiation levels because they're not very accurate in radiation levels, but mostly uh, to detect if radiation is present. I could suggest ionizing chambers, which are also used in radiotherapy. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right, Maria. There, there, there are many better ways, but uh, there's no quicker way. Uh, and when we're looking at 400 different locations and walking around, the Geiger counter actually is a very good measure of, of the contamination levels in both Chernobyl and Fukushima. We validated our measurements with, with the Geiger counters uh, by putting TLD dosimeters out in the landscape, but also taking soil samples and, and using uh, gamma spectrometry uh, to, to actually correlate the two. And for the purposes of what we're doing, uh, they actually uh, work quite well. Uh, and so um, the, uh, um, we really haven't had an issue uh, <clears throat> with that. 
part of the experiment. Since we're really comparing high, medium, and low, uh, we don't need spectacularly accurate measures. Uh, again, we've gotten at some of these issues by, um, by also putting dosimeters on individual birds and also actually uh, putting dosimeters inside the rodents, and, and, and so we get a pretty good idea. We also take the birds and the rodents and put them inside gamma spectrometers to see how much of a body burden they actually have. So yeah, we're, we're well aware of the shortcomings of using a simple Geiger counter, but, and, but you're absolutely right. It is, it's, a, it's a quick and dirty way to say that there's, there's actual uh, there's radioactivity there. You, you just can't tell what it kind of is. Uh, in Fukushima, you know, uh, we find all sorts of things popping up on these cameras, uh, and uh, including the Google, the Google mobile uh, for Google, uh, Google, uh, um, um, you know, um, uh, what, what's it called, Street View. Uh, in fact, so if you go on Google Maps, you can you can see some of our cameras, <laughs> and uh, I thought that was really kind of interesting. So anyway, uh, you know, what's happening to the mammals? Well, it, it's very clear uh, that you know, even though absolute abundances of these large mammals has unquestionably gone up because of the reduced hunting and reduced human disturbance, but there is still a very strong effect uh, of radioactive contamination. Uh, for Fukushima, we can see this response here on the right-hand side of the graph, uh, where we're looking at the effects of radiation independently of the effects of latitude, longitude, and uh, elevation. So strong effects. Um, Let's see, Deb asks, how does radioactivity affect technology? Uh, and so that's a good question. You know, and, and low levels of radioactivity don't, you know, our, our electronics can, can deal with it. Uh, we don't see strong effects uh, on, on, on the electronics. But, you know, of course, you know, one of the problems with at both Chernobyl and Fukushima is that they would try to stick in cameras, video cameras, to see where, where the spent fuel was. And the radiation was so high that it would actually burn out the circuits for these cameras, and so there is there is a problem with that. Uh, but uh, but but for our purposes, it's really at the levels that we're working at, it's not an issue. The, the you know the, the last question here today is really this issue of of adaptation. So so we've had Chernobyl for for over 30 years, uh, you know, seven years since Fukushima. Is there any evidence that the plants and animals are actually adapting? To this radioactivity, uh, and, uh, and and you know there's there's a couple of papers out uh, showing that um, uh, the uh, that bacteria, for instance, uh, are showing some signs of radioactivity. In fact, we did a study on the bacteria living on the wings of birds <laughs> that live in different levels of, of contamination, and, and and brought them these bacteria to the lab and cultured them and and then zapped them with radiation and found that indeed. Uh, some of the bacteria, the bacteria from intermediate radiation areas, actually did better uh, under radiation uh, than, than any of the other uh, populations of bacteria, even though the species are likely to be the same. So there is some evidence that bacteria have adapted. There's a hint that some of the birds have uh, pre, that are pre-adapted to, to the radiation through different allocations of antioxidants to deal with it. But uh, the point of this paper that we wrote, uh, again, another meta-analysis, uh, was that, unfortunately, most of the studies that have attempted to look for adaptation have not been done very well. They have not been done well enough to really determine whether there's been adaptation or not. And so hopefully there'll be more studies in the future to get at this. So what does this all mean? Well, the, you know, the, again, the main conclusion here is that there's now lots of information demonstrating that there are effects of radiation, at least at the higher levels, uh, to individuals, populations, species, and, and even ecosystem function uh, stemming from the radiation. There's also evidence that there really is no evidence of a threshold below which there's no effect. So, so a little bit of extra radiation has a small effect, but a lot of extra radiation has a big effect. And, and this is a really important observation. Uh, there's also data now to suggest that animals living in the wild, living in nature, are much more vulnerable to the effects of radiation than animals living in the laboratory, for instance. And we think this has to do with the fact that there's synergism, there's interaction among all of the different stressors that affect natural populations. Natural populations have to have to find food. They have to avoid being eaten. They have to avoid, well, they have to deal with diseases and parasites. 
And all of these different stressors seem to interact with the additional stressor induced by radiation to reduce, uh, to increase their, their vulnerability even more than would ever be predicted. Uh, and again, just uh, this is just a summary of the hypotheses that we've been trying to address. Uh, lessons for the future, uh, really, we need to do more of this low dose radiation research because as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are using radiation in our in medicine more and more. We know that it has huge beneficial uh, applications for, for many people, save many lives, but there are also risks associated with it that we need to, to more accurately characterize uh, for future work. Uh, we have to, again, deal with the fact that we live in this, this un, unstable world where there's the potential for, for, for nuclear terrorism, dirty bombs, even, even um, thermonuclear devices. We need to know more about what the potential impacts um, might be on natural systems. Uh, and this really is, uh, you know, again, uh, an issue uh, of growing concern and in, in increasingly. Hopefully, hopefully this will, um, this will be, <laughs> this won't be a problem, but it, but it certainly is something we need to think about. Last point, uh, we're actually starting to do work with, with dogs in Chernobyl. There are many dogs roaming around, and so we're, we've actually put dosimeters on all these dogs. And so we'll be tracking them in the future uh, to see how well they're doing. Uh, and, uh, and hopefully, uh, uh, we'll, we'll have something more to tell you about this next time I'm on biodiversity uh, teaching. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, that, that's really uh, all I had to say, other than uh, to thank everybody who's helped me with this. Uh, let's see. One of your first trips to the site, uh, were you nervous about how it would affect you? Um, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. Uh, of course, there was a little bit of nervousness because, you know, Chernobyl, and we were afraid to eat the food, and uh, we didn't really know what it was like. And then, you know, as we were reading some of the literature, we became less fearful because, uh, you know, much of the, much of the, many of the publications uh, suggested that there really wasn't a large effect of, of the radiation. And then we started to publish our own work and realized, well, there, there actually are significant consequences for the animals. And so we got a little bit more nervous about it again. So, so you know, we try not to bring young people to, to these areas uh, simply because uh, clearly there's a stronger effect for, for young individuals or pregnant women uh, and, and so we want to reduce the potential hazards to these folks. Um, and, uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, um, uh, yeah, it's something to be concerned about. Let's see, anything else? We have a couple more minutes if anybody has any other questions. Uh, let's see. As always, oh, well, I, thank you very much, uh, EHS2. <laughs> it's always my pleasure. And uh, really, uh, really fun to be here. Uh, I wish there was more feedback. I wish I could see you <laughs> while, while presenting. Uh, but, uh, but hopefully, we'll get a chance to do that in the future um, uh, as, as, as the technology improves. Um, so thank you very much. And, uh, and, and thanks again to, to Deb and her crew. Uh, uh, hopefully, we'll see you next year.